And thank you all for coming. My name is Karen Nelson, and I am the Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator for the City of Appleton. It is my pleasure to be here this evening. You'll notice there's a little raspiness in my voice. I lost it over the weekend, along with my mom. Thank you. I just returned this morning uh, out of dedication and commitment to this event and to commemorate the past 20 years of this wonderful creation of this wonderful position for the city of Appleton. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you the person who, in 1996, was first elected mayor of the city of Appleton and has the, has the distinction of actually having his election results above the fold line in 1996. <laughs> And it was for good cause and good reason, because of his vision. One year later, in 1997, on October 1st, actually, this position was first created. So at this time, I will bring to the podium none other than the Honorable Mayor Timothy Hanna. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it was not because of my vision. <laughs> We're going to hear uh, a minute in a minute from the person, um, one of the people whose vision this was. I was just in a position to say, good idea. <laughs> That's what I do a lot. Um, but I think it's part of being a leader, is being open to different ideas. And one of the things I want to frame this with is something that I think Appleton has become known for, and that is. Um, Being proactive, thinking about the future, looking at things that are happening, and figuring out ways that we can either take advantage of the things that are coming, or we can put ourselves in a position where we don't have to react because we've thought about it ahead of time. This is one of those areas. Um, back in 1996, 1997, um, you know, Appleton, as a city, was about 97% white. But there were some people who saw the demographic trends and said, you know what, our, our city is going to change. <clears throat> the demographics of our city are going to change. And we need to think about that now. And like any good city, what we want is we want a relationship with all of our citizens. Not just some of them, but all of them. And so this was one proactive step that we could take forward along with the Appleton Area School District, who I have to say is just a marvelous partner with the city of Appleton in so many endeavors. I know there's a lot of my colleagues around the state that are, have some jealousy over the wonderful relationship that we have with our school district and the number of things that, that we do collaboratively together. So um, thank you for coming. Uh, when um, I was lucky enough to hire uh, Karen for this position, one of the first things she said was, you had this position for 20 years. We need to celebrate that. You know what? She's right. We do. We're not perfect. We've got a long ways to go. We've got a lot of work to do. But, I will say, as a city, we do strategic planning, we do think about things, and one of the things in our strategic plan is celebrate our successes. Do a better job at telling our story. So I think this fulfills one of those objectives of, you know what, let's talk about some of the successes we have. Let's talk about, and the other thing that it says in our strategic plan is learn from our failures. We've had some bumps along the way. And so, yeah, it's okay to talk about those as long as we learn our lesson. Don't make the same mistakes going forward. So that's hopefully what tonight is about. Thank you for being here with us. And
and uh, enjoy the evening. Thanks. And next, we will bring up the fine local leadership of this established campus, Dr. Matt Mino, principal of East <laughs> High School. Thank you for having us with you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. And uh, it's such a great event to be able to have this here for first, it's an area of learning. And I think we are constantly learning in everything we're doing and through the interactions we have with others as we engage in our conversation as a community. I'm very blessed to be and have been a part of East for the last 11 years now. This is my seventh year as principal. And one of the things that we really focus on at our building is this concept of an ethic of care. And the idea is really to try to identify each of our 1,600 individual stories. Because we all walk a different path, a different life, and we really need to take that time to listen and learn that story and become aware of that story. Because if we don't, we're probably shutting down an opportunity of learning. And so tonight, we can also embrace that ethic of care while we're here through learning with each other in an amazing place, uh, the Appleton Area School District and Appleton East High School. We're, again, we are so fortunate to have amazing schools with that same principle and same mission for every child, every day, as together we learn and grow as a community. So thank you, enjoy the time here, and go Patriots. <laughs> what I was attempting to do was to pull up the video of our first chief of police that the position reported to. That was and is Chief Rick Myers. He was kind enough to actually videotape us a five minute intro for this evening and then promptly deleted it. And about an hour ago, <laughs> as I was walking out of the office, he figured out that he thought he deleted it off of his computer, but it was still in the cloud and resent it, but now because of the limitations on internet access at a public school, which there should be, thank you very much. <laughs> we can't get to it. But uh, he was also kind enough to provide his words that I will now read for you. These are the words of Chief Rick Myers. When I was appointed to the Office of Chief of Police for the City of Appleton, it was apparent to me that the growing Hmong population was disconnected from most governmental services, including the police department. Community policing as a, as a philosophy requires a strong partnership between the community members and their police. In the mid-1990s, there was also an influx of Hispanics moving into the Fox Valley. Additionally, other people of color who may have been relocating to the area were very wary of the police due to other national concerns in other cities regarding racial profiling, etc. Altogether, it was clear to me that the agency needed to be quite proactive, the mayor's word, in changing those relationships. Therefore, when I first conceived the position, I wanted it to have two primary goals. One, for that individual to be an internal subject matter expert who would constantly study the practices and policies of the APD and advise the staff of this very treatment, either intentional or even unintentional, so that it could be remedied through training, policy development, 
accountability, etc. Number two, my vision for this position was to be an external ambassador for minorities and people of color throughout the community to help better connect the agency with the community. Minority recruitment and hiring, improving cooperation from victims and witnesses, improving the overall sense of welcomeness and wholeness and inclusion for minorities, and to also help community leaders feel informed and knowledgeable on police practices. During that time, it was also well known to me that fiscally, that's with an F, not a PH, <laughs> it would be very tough to sell this to both the mayor and the council. Budget dollars are always tight in any city, and Appleton is no exception. So I thought we might have a chance if we could just start it off as a part-time job, but also knew that we needed to have the first person to hold the position be exceptionally skilled, and we wouldn't attract that kind of applicant for a part-time job. Therefore, I, Chief Rick Myers, turned to my good friend and colleague, the late Dr. Tom Scullin, superintendent of the Appleton Area School District and asked if he would please fund half of the position if I could secure the other half through the city of Appleton. He readily agreed and together we approached both the school board and the city's common council. Thankfully, we secured the funding jointly that first year. During the application process, we had Pam Herr, then Pam Vang, to work closely with us on Hmong community issues. As a citizen, she participated in the interview of candidates, and we ended that first hiring process feeling that none of the initial candidates were quite the right fit for this brand new job with the city. So my staff and I began pressing Pam <laughs> to consider taking it on. We all knew that it was going to be a great sacrifice on her career, and yet she agreed to leave her lucrative private sector job to come and work for us in the city of Appleton. It was pivotal in growing that position into something that obviously was the right step and the right choice to make because it has now been sustained for 20 years. Pam did a remarkable job. During her tenure, we hired APD's first Hmong police officer, developed Hmong language citizen academies for the clan leaders, and enjoyed an overall growth in relationship building. Pam did not only focus on Hmong issues, however, because of her inclusive vision for the job. And as I look back now on the 20 years that have passed, I would argue that the need for this position is not the same today as it was then, only greater is our new opportunities because of the national narrative. The national narrative has taken some egregious examples from around the country and woven them into a blanket of condemnation against the police everywhere. We don't want that in Appleton. Today's officers face unparalleled mistrust among some in the community, but we don't want that in Appleton. Likewise, our young and noble officers hired today, some have limited sense of history of the civil rights era, of the struggles that have been fought, of the dark history that policing has played in many other communities. We don't want that here in Appleton. So both the public and the police would benefit from significantly increasing our own training and the relationship building necessary, precisely the original vision of the intercultural relations coordinator now evolved to become the diversity and inclusion coordinator. 
respectfully submitted, Chief Rick Myers. At this time, I'm going to uh, actually bring up the uh, moderator, Dr. Shelton Good, and then I will show the, the video before he brings up our panels, panelists. Dr. Shelton Good is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for MARTA in Atlanta, Georgia. He is responsible for leveraging diversity to enhance the company's strategic business results. He is also the author of many books, three to be exact. The one that I use is my personal blueprint, Diversity Managers, Angels of Mercy or Barbarians at the Gate, <laughs> and want to make you holler. <laughs> Diversity in America from Strawberry Mansion to Silicon Valley, and also ABD, all but dissertation, because of course he has a PhD. He is a leader with over 20 years of human resource and business experience, most recently prior to moving back to Atlanta. Uh, we had him here for a short period of time in the Box Valley as the director of diversity with Oshkosh Corporation. He has held executive HR positions for companies raising in size from a half a million to 18 billion plus, and has developed or implemented talent management programs, performance management systems, and sales incentive plans, labor relations strategies, and large-scale cultural change initiatives all along the way from coast to coast. With that, I bring to you none other than our moderator for this evening, my good doctor, Dr. Shelton Good. So as Dr. Good is about to bring up all of the panelists that are here with us tonight, I'd like to introduce you now to all of my predecessors. So welcome to the first 20 years of diversity and inclusion in the city of Appleton. So there he is, the chief himself, the original creator of this position, and all-around visionary leader. He served in the position from 1995 to 2007, and the statement that was already provided in the video statement provided that he didn't hire. <laughs> um, his current position, he wanted me to let you know that why he cannot be here with us this evening, is because he is he has accepted the executive director's position where he's now the chief of chiefs nationwide and is in the process of moving to Boulder, Colorado, now as the new executive director of the Major Cities Chiefs Association. But he does send his love and let, wanted me to let everyone know how much he appreciates getting his start in this area of diversity and inclusion here in Africa. And you've already heard the story about Superintendent Stella. So here he is in action, doing some diversity work on the radio. And there's our Dr. Pam Hurt. And uh, our moderator will get into greater details about their background. In fact, the very first couple of positions was entitled, as you've heard, Intercultural Relations Coordinator. And they actually reported to the Deputy Chief who reported to the chief of police, who reported to the mayor. So that uh, was the person of Greg Peterson there that you see in this picture. Sarah Druckery was the second person to hold the position, also entitled Intercultural Relations Coordinator. She originally started as a community relations coordinator in the police department, nothing to do with this uh, actual diversity position and later moved into that position in 2000 after Pam Her. Some more action shots in between. <laughs> There's Sarah Druckery in action. Hello, how may I help you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, blazing, blazing away for me to come along. Mito Kudaka sends his greetings to us from Albania, where he's now moved since moving away from Appleton. 
he's just, he was just a delight. He was absolutely brokenhearted that he could not get here. But of course, sent his con contributing uh, words and accomplishments to us this way. Nicole Lemke is uh, still here in the area. She came next, and at, at, this, at this juncture of the creation of the position, uh, it was a joint job sharing that took place between Nicole Lemke, and these are some of her accomplishments. Of course, she said the, big, the biggest one was being a part of the interview committee that hired Kathy Flores. <laughs> <laughs> was the most impactful thing that she did. I just asked people to give me what they thought their accomplishments were, and that's what she credited. And they job shared together, her, Nicole, and Polly Mua, who you will see tonight. And these are some of her accomplishments. This is during one of the Hmong New Year celebrations. And then that was followed by the longest serving individual in this position, my predecessor, my immediate past predecessor, Kathy Flores, and she was the longest serving for seven years. And again, I will let the moderator go through her two-page dissertation of all of her accomplishments. One of them being right here, um, which is an action shot taken by the Post Crescent, and yes, we did get permission to use it tonight, uh, regarding same-sex couples going down and protesting at the Allegheny County uh, Clerk's Office and, and ultimately did receive that, uh, that uh, positive position um, and having that original decision reversed regarding their marriage, marriage license applications. And then there's me, the new kid on the block. <laughs> so with that, Okay, if I could have if I could have my panelists um, join us, the ones that's gonna be participating, come on up. For the sake of time, we're gonna I'm gonna take some moderator privileges. While, while they're coming while they're coming up, let me answer the, the sixty four thousand dollar question. Um, why, why did they have this guy come all the way back from Atlanta to uh, facilitate this panel? Well, the answer is simple. This is my adopted uh, my adopted uh, hometown uh, for two years as head of uh, global diversity for the Oshkosh Corporation. Um, I work closely with um, nonprofit, education, government, uh, the chamber to um, advance um, the uh, diversity and inclusion efforts of the, uh, of, the, of the Fox Valley, Appleton in particular, and was just excited when um, Karen um, invited me to come back. And, uh, we, we go back quite a ways, but then she really double teamed. She had Kathy call me, and everybody knows we don't say no to Kathy. So um, the, I, I came all the way from Atlanta, where when I left this uh, afternoon at 2:30, it was 71 degrees. When I landed here, it was 36. So y'all show the brother some love, okay? <laughs> We're just going to jump into this, and I'll have the panel, uh, we'll have some discussions here that will allow the panel members to tell you even a little bit more um, about themselves, but we're going to make up uh, a little bit of ground and, and have some fun. So the, the purpose of today's um, panel is to dig a little bit deeper into some diversity and inclusion themes. Um, I'm sure you want to hear about the, the panelists' real life experiences, um, being in the, in the position of what is now the city's diversity and inclusion coordinator. Um, I'm going to challenge the panelists to talk about what has shaped their, their thinking, um, ways that they've gone about advocating and, and, and challenging and advancing diversity and inclusion. And I, I, if you know anything about these guys, it's not going to be that hard to, um, to, to make sure that they are their sincere, authentic, candid self. Um, and I'm going to ask them to talk about ways in which they um, support, uh, well, let's put it like this, things that they could go back into the time machine, you know, what would they do over again? What, what kind of support uh, would they like to have had from internal and external stakeholders? And, and more importantly, going forward, um, what do we need to do? So it's gonna, we're going to break the questions up in three buckets. Talk a little bit about the past, talk a little bit about to, today, but more, save most of our time for the, the, the future. 
and I've got some questions prepared for them, but we've got a microphone, and um, if I can take just, a, a, again, a little bit more moderator privileges. Coming from Atlanta, um, we, we have a thing we call, we let the spirit move you. <laughs> so if the, the spirit so moves you and you want to just jump up and, and ask a question, uh, we'll, we'll make sure we acknowledge you, uh, rather than hold all the questions to the, uh, to the end. Let's make this a, a discussion rather than a presentation, okay? We good? All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. So, um, now, I'll, a couple ground rules. Time won't allow everybody to respond to every question. So I'm a, some questions will be directed to some panel members. Others I'll just throw out and see um, who, wants to, uh, who wants to address it. But for this first one, I want to hear from everybody. So tell us a little bit about um, the, uh, the business case. Um, how was the role developed? How was it presented to you? And more importantly, um, what, what, do you, what, what do you, what have you, what do you believe, looking back on it now, was the major reason why this position was even um, necessary, considering we're talking back 1997. Okay, so let's hear from everybody on, on that. Let's go back into the time machine. Who wants to go first? I can start first. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I can start. I'm Pam Hur. <laughs> and um, I was privileged to be able to work with Chief Myers and the late Dr. Scullin when we uh, talked about this position and why it was a necessity within our community. And the basis for that was that Chief Myers was someone who had just come in as, as police chief, but he realized there were a lot of challenges within our community. Um, and then we had Dr. Scullin, who also was new to our community, and was someone who had led a very diverse school district prior to coming here to the Fox Valley, to Appleton. And as a result of that, they were able to see things that were happening here that you know, as part of this community, living in day in and day out, we see certain things, but we, for whatever reason, we feel like, um, you know, the things that are happening are just things that happen in all communities. It's part about, it's part of a, a community that's growing. And so our community was very reactive at that time. When issues came up, we addressed those issues. Um, if there were no issues, nobody wanted to rock the boat. And as a result of that, there was tremendous um, division within our community, especially between the general community and the communities of color. Um, and I think that was because there was the lack of trust and lack of understanding of everybody that was in the community. And there was no unity in that. And when they started to experience some of those issues at the police department, as well as the school district, and in the mid-90s, um, we had tremendous challenges with our young uh, monk students growing up and facing challenges with gang-related issues and the whole gang piece of it. And as a result of that, um, there was a lot of distrust between the Hmong refugees and the, the police department because they didn't, first of all, it was a cultural thing, right? And because it was a cultural thing, Policing back in Laos was very different from policing here in the United States. And back in Laos, when you were in Laos and the police approached you, you ran away from the police because there was a lot of corruption and they were really not there to protect you. And so that's their whole um, perspective and their whole vision of what policing was. And so when the police started to approach the different um, community members to ask them for assistance and understanding what was going on so we could address some of the, the issues and things like that and people's fears of what we considered were gang related things, which really wasn't. I mean, if you really look at the bigger picture. But because there was this distress, there were a lot of issues within the community and there was a, a, a disconnect. And so Dr. Scullin saw that in the school district and Chief Meyer saw it in the community as his officers were policing out there trying to get cooperation and things like that as well too. So because of those issues and challenges, instead of being reactive to that, they wanted to take a proactive approach to it. And as Chief Myers began to think more about the different things that you could do to be more proactive, he was a tremendous proponent of community policing and engaging the police. 
uh, are engaging the community in policing and helping them become our eyes and ears and helping them being engaged in creating a safe community for everyone. And so that was his vision. And from that, he started to formulate kind of what it was that would work in this community. And he went to Dr. Scott, as he, he indicated, and they talked a lot about how can they come together to resolve this issue and be proactive with it. And he knew he couldn't do it in the city by himself, but with Dr. Scullin's support and the fact that what was happening in the community was impacting both the school district and the community as a whole, that he would be proactive in that as well too. So they came together, we came together, and we put together a vision of what we hope to accomplish with this position. And I was part of the hiring committee with them, so I helped them interview all the people <laughs> that applied. And as we began to talk about this, this was a very new, innovative position. It's never been done anywhere in the state. Um, you know, for the most part, the state of Wisconsin, uh, I grew up in, in Wisconsin um, as a young refugee uh, uh, child and then a young lady. And, you know, we in the state of Wisconsin was very uh, reactive to a lot of things and they wanted to take a proactive approach. So as we were looking through what we could do, this position came out of that. And as we were looking for ways in which we could make this position, you know, something that would be sustained within the city beyond my term or, you know, anyone's term, but to have it interwoven into the uh, fabric of who Appleton was and who Appleton re represented. And that was not just the, you know, the people that um, felt that they belonged in this city and belonged in this community, but also everyone else that had so much value, so much to contribute to the community, that didn't, that never had a chair at the table, that, that never had a platform in which they could share that with the community. So because of that, the position was created. And the, the position was created to really engage the community in a way that there was trust that was built. And through that trust, we would create a safer community together and we would raise our children together and we would be united as one. And so I was very privileged to be the very first intercultural relations coordinator. And it's hard for me to say diversity and inclusion coordinator because I've always uh, known the position to be intercultural relations coordinator. So I was privileged to be asked to be part of that initiative. And when I started in that position, one of the things that I really wanted to focus on was to empower the leaders within the communities of color to be able to empower their communities to come together to resolve issues and concerns. Not only that, but collectively together, I brought together all the leaders of the different communities together because, you know, with them together as one voice, it was a very powerful statement whenever we delivered a message to our community, to our uh, leaders within our community, it was something that was very powerful that, that a lot of them had never experienced um, being in this, this group that was united in terms of what we wanted to accomplish collectively together. So that was something that I think um, was very pivotal, was not to come in and tell people this is what you need to do, but to be able to listen to people and empower them so that they understood what they needed and they, was, they were able to communicate effectively. Um, with a greater community and with our leaders. Okay. So. Anybody want to add anything to that? So I came, I'm Kathy Flores, um, last diversity coordinator before Karen Nelson. Um, I came to the city when it was in the mayor's office and I think, so a little different perspective of where it started and to where the position started to, the direction that the position started to take was, um, I think, the position began to be seen as something, a position that was only when police matters were involved. Mm -hmm. And so the position moved to the mayor's office to, as you said, to make a business case for it because we saw the growing diversity and inclusion um, in the city, or the diversity in, in the city of Appleton. And so, as Mayor Hannah said, you know, 97% white just a couple of decades ago, now about, the last census was about 85%. And we knew that we needed to start um, engaging the business community because we were starting to hear from the Kimberly Clarks of the world and things like that, that they wanted to bring employees into the Fox Valley and they wanted to have a very strong um, support of diverse communities because if 
they were going to be successful in recruiting, and not just recruiting, but retaining their business force, they would have to have a successful community around them. And so we started to do work with organizations like that. Uh, I mean, that, that work started before I became, but that's part of why it moved to the mayor's office when it did in 2006, I believe. It moved to the mayor's office in 2006. And part of that move was to make sure that we made a business case for it. We started to include the business community. Um, in fact, one of when I came on board in 2009, one of the first things that we did was work with Kimberly Clark Corporation, and they sent me to um, New York to have to go through a seminar to look at business um, measurements and benchmarks for this position, because up to this point there were some goals, of course, for the position, but they didn't tie into the city's strategic plan. And we knew that in order to retain this position, everything that happened through this position had to tie into the city's strategic plan. And in fact, the city's strategic plan needed to change, and it did. It included diversity and inclusion as a business objective and as a city objective. So. As the city evolved and as the position evolved, it became much more of a position that also supported the business community and supported that um, employers trying to recruit and retain. Now, it still had the element of advocacy and, and working, you know, with marginalized individuals and marginalized um, folks. So there, it was a it was an interesting mix of business as well as um, advocacy within our community. But that's kind of the evolution from where it started to where um, it, ha it has grown over the years. Mm -hmm. Sarah, um, you were second um, in the position. Um, who were, um, by this time, who were some of the, the, the key stakeholders internally and externally that you had to work with? What, if anything, had changed well, by um, the time you came into the position? Well, um, it was shortly after hmm. um, um, and I stepped in already being in the department, and I was working with um, inter-community um, communications, like the um, D.A.R.E. program and Neighborhood Watch. And so it was not difficult to kind of also connect. Uh, the key stakeholders, in my case, that I detected were the individual families, the individual um, citizens, the residents, with the specific stories regarding miscommunication, misunderstanding, misinformation, ill-informed neighbors. So when we came in, it, when I came in, sorry, <laughs> it was um, uh, people would kind of, the layers would be peeled from, away from, you know, the services and, and the departments and the we and the people and the groups and then we started um, being approachable and so we had families and we had um, individuals and I can, you know, I can, my mind goes to key families and instances where they were, they were just dreading communicating their fears and um, they had been experiencing some serious um, um, harassment or even a, um, just self-imposed um, limits on all the services that were offered to them and they, um, so it just actually door to door and case to case and it was not a heavy knock and the badge and it was not the car and the unit, it was actually you know, my silly little smiley face, and, like introducing myself and telling them that I was there for them, that we were there for them, that we were there to help them with their, um, whatever case it may have been, it was um, maybe a child that needed a proper um, vaccination, um, the mom that needed to be properly um, directed towards um, health care, or the, um, the child that was, um, you know, under um, particular um, education, mis, you know, mis um, diagnosed and IEPs also with service. And so um, I can think of specific families and children. I've seen grown adults now that are like, um, oh, you want to be to my house and talk to my mom. And so um, it was just the, the um, people feeling that we were approachable and we were there to serve them directly, whether it was Jerry Schutz who spoke Spanish or Officer Bang or myself or um, um, Tao also, or even, you know, the regular Conkles, <laughs> the Lunkies and all the other names that were actually pretty much um, welcomed again, and not again, but welcomed eventually. And it was fire inspection and police that would have my services and my my um, connection, and so that's also how it's it was connected to 
to the city then because I would be borrowed by the inspections department or the fire department or and it's just that they wanted to communicate little details that normally would, would feel um, um, you know kind of like imposing on them they felt that certain citizens felt like they were doing wrong and really they weren't they just did not know that there were certain things like curbside appeals or how to put your garbage can out and put it back in and how different things that were really not law enforcement issues, they were just citizenship issues and citizenry issues and rights and responsibilities and often we were there to express the rights that they had and oftentimes they were really pleased and surprised and um, it was uh, those cases that kind of appeared that are still connected to a lot of the cases that now then of course when you impact one story and they could turn around and tell the neighbors and they share about their church and then so that also in and of itself, um, bottom up kind of thing was, was effective. Okay. I'm um, probably, um, so let's take, let's, let's kill a, a in the back a little bit and um, and get some personal insights. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in what are some of the, the personal experiences or the, the compelling events that ex that influenced um, your thinking probably around this uh, inclusion and, and how have they, um, motivated you to, to get involved and and being an advocate for change. Okay, so I just want to add my little uh, two cents in terms of uh, my transition into the role. So when um, it was a shared role at the time, and uh, it was a dual uh, role between myself and Nicole Lunky, and so um, at that time, you know, I thought, okay, you know, this would be a great way for me to impact my community. Um, you know, be able to lead in a variety of different ways and also uh, visually be present um, in moving change forward. And, uh, you know, Nicole and I can attest to this that, um, you know, when I came on board in 2008, one week I, I realized, like, how, how is this job possible being a part-time position, um, being a shared position, and so, um, because the need was so great in the community, but I think the impact and the visual presence was even greater. And so um, when uh, I left the position in 2009, uh, I was in the position for uh, almost eight months. Um, and again, I got a glimpse and a taste of um, you know, what this position meant to the city and the impact and the change that it could have. Um, and Nicole and I both realized that it really needs a full-time person to be able to um, meet the capacity of the community and and uh, we, we were so thankful that we were able to hire Kathy uh, taking on that full-time position. But uh, uh, to kind of answer your question, um, you know, I think change really comes with resilience. It comes with education. Um, it comes with unity and community and working together. And so, you know, Nicole and I, again, um, she's not here, but a great colleague uh, of mine. It was a dual position, but we both found out real quickly that you know, again, the need was so great that it required a full-time person to be able to uh, carry on their responsibilities um, and really impact change. Um, and so that's why the position moved from part-time to full-time. Okay, uh, question from the, the audience. Anybody from what you've heard so far? Anybody got a question? Okay, ma'am, you want to step up to the, the mic? Just so that everybody can hear you. Plus, I believe we may be live streaming or something, so we just want to make sure we this is a real quick question. I'm trying to make sure I understand the timeline. So it started as a full-time position, right? Why did it go to the part-time or chair status? Good question. Um, I think at that time, we um, the position was trying to um, make that balance between work-life balance. Um, and again, I can only speak from when I came uh, on board um, in that short time frame, but you know, my colleague Nicole, she was in the position full time and, you know, a, a full time working mom, and then, um, you know, lots of different dynamics that happen. And so um, that's why I think the position became part time for a little bit, or all the uh, Mayor Hannah kind of talk about it if he wants to share. Just real quick, it, it was never part time, it was always full time. It started out as a shared position with the school district, that, that was one year. And we, I think we both quickly realized there's way more work here. And so the school district went ahead and, and they hired full time and we hired uh, Pam full time. It was full time. When it got to Nicole, Nicole was full time and Nicole had a baby. 
And then she said, you know, I really, I don't want to leave, but you know, I've got a little baby at home. And so we started talking about, well, is there a possibility for a shared position? So it was still a full-time position. It became a shared full-time position between Nicole and Polly. And so it was still full-time. There was still full-time work, more than full-time work, but it was a shared position. So it wasn't part, they both worked part-time, but it was still a full-time position. Apologies. And then in 2009, I had a baby as well. So then we both decided that, you know, it was better to have it be in a full-time position. So lots of babies during that time. I broke the cycle. <laughs> 1997 to 2017. Um, diversity and inclusion helping companies and communities be more diverse, be more inclusive, change. That's what I do for a living. So I, I travel uh, the country and, and in fact have traveled the globe. I did some research. You would be fascinated to know that when you look at cities of a comparable size, comparable demographics, Throw so in social economics, throw in some other things, what those of, those of us in research call independent variables. There are no zero cities that have a full time diversity coordinator for 20 years. No. full-time um, position, um, but then when I look at some of the uh, issues that they take on and some of the progress that they've made, again, um, and I have gone on record writing this in, in my last book, there are none that have made in the same time period the sort of progress um, that you guys have made here in Appleton. So let's, um, let's, let's go back to our panel and take us behind the scenes because I know you, you guys talked a lot about processes. You talked a, you talked a little bit about some of your accomplishments. But take us behind the scenes and, and share with us uh, one of your most funniest uh, memories, one of your most uh, memorable moments, or one of your most trying moments, whichever one you want to take. And again, uh, lightning round, short answer. I want to hear from everybody. Take us behind the scenes, because everything wasn't um, always rosy. So or, you know, just tell us about something funny that happened. Maybe let's go first. Well, it's, I don't know, I hope you think it's funny. <laughs> um, we had, um, we were on a, not we, but an officer was on a call, and he had to intervene and sit with uh, a particular individual who was a little bit more, what he called combative. And so it was Officer Riddell, Keith Riddell. And I showed up to translate, um, and um, it was often very handy that way. And so he had to um, ride with him in the ambulance, and so he just threw me the keys to the unit. And he said, Sarah, I need you to follow me in the <laughs> this police unit. <laughs> and um, I so had to follow him in his, in his police unit vehicle. And um, of course, I, went, I, got, I hit every red light possible on the way to the hospital, but I so wanted so bad <laughs> to turn on my lights and run it. But I didn't. You didn't but, turn on the lights? <laughs> no. <laughs> and as he was getting into the ambulance, I just said, it's not a, it's not a stick ship, is it? It was like an ambulance. <laughs> that was it. Well, why did you hit the lights? I don't know. I thought that was it. Oh, OK. I think you have to have your humor in this position, so there are a lot of funny moments, but honestly, they are also tinged with a lot of racism and xenophobia. Um, but really, it was the folks, um, and they, they, they were a very small minority of folks who opposed the position, but they happened to always be the loudest. Um, so for me, I just remember somebody walking into my office and throwing down something from some national organization um, and started to accuse me of wanting to pass Sharia law in Appleton. Now, I am a queer woman, and so the, the outline that he was kind of showing me was like, you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and this, and this, and I, I said, 
you realize I'm a, I'm a lesbian woman, those things, like, that, that wouldn't be good for me. Like, I wouldn't be passing that. Like, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be helpful for me. And, uh, you know, I just said, no, we don't pass anything by any religious text, including the Quran, the Bible, you know, and he you know, took a little bit of offense that I included religious texts like the Bible and the Quran, the Torah, all in, all together. But, you know, at one point we just have to laugh because we got lots of calls like that, and, you know, just lots of things said to us that weren't uh, quite appropriate. Even our city council, who some are here, have had people show up and say things that probably would raise the hair on the back of your neck, but at some point you just have to laugh because it, you know, you have to have a sense of humor. I, I can share a quick story as well. Um, when I was in the position, we used to have um, a segment on the um, on Wisconsin radio, and so I would um, do some conversations and people would phone in um, and I would try to answer them as best as I can. And if anyone knows Cor Sean, who is the owner of Wisconsin Home Radio, he's a, he was a very humorous man. And so um, at the end of one segment, he would he would be like, you know, Polly, she's an advocate for us. She works for the city of Appleton. And, you know, if you ever have any speeding tickets, go and see her. <laughs> Um, so the next day, um, a lot of Hmong residents <laughs> showed up, and uh, my colleagues were like, what's happening? And so we had to have a, a, a conversation about that in terms of, you know, even though it's humorous, you can't really advertise um, some of these types of services because people will come in, and then I'll have to be able to break that news to them. So when I think back on things that are humorous or funny during that period of time, I think uh, the only thing that came out was um, when I first started in the department, there was uh, another lady there by the name of Pam. And if I say this, I, I don't know if the police chief is here, he probably knows, but but she worked there and her husband worked there. And someone mistaken me for her. And, and they kept saying to me, so your husband said this, and your husband said that. And I'm thinking, my husband? What? How do you know my husband? <laughs> and I was like in shock that they knew my husband, who my husband was, and later on, Someone came up and said, no, not that Pam, the other Pam. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I think I have to go back to my real name, which is Papua, which my mother would be very proud if I used that name. So I, that was the humorous thing that happened to me. Probably the second or third day that, that I worked at the department, and I was kind of shocked that everybody knew who my husband was. So. Um, Sarah, this is for you. Um, so if you were in a police unit and you had a chance to come on by, let's see a show of hands on how many people were. Come on, come on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, uh, um, I had to bring up that funniest moment because um, I remember when I first got here, my, uh, the first, my third day here, it was the Juneteenth weekend. And I found out that your honorable mayor can't do the wobble worth <laughs> that, That's not the funny part. The next year, I thought I had gotten the MC and some brothers and sisters to work with him. He still can't wobble. <laughs> Your Honor, right. when you come to the, the, the Juneteenth festival, you got to be able to wobble. But we're, we're working. We're working on it. <laughs> we're, still, we're still working on that. Um, yeah, put, put that on a strategic plan. Got to be able to wobble at the Juneteenth festival. Um, I would like one of you to talk about a, a little bit about some specific ways um, that you advocated for change while in the position and any successes or challenges you faced. Who wants to take that one? So, when I came into that position, one of the things that we agreed upon, Chief Myers and Dr. Scullin and I agreed upon, is that we were, they were going to be okay if we, if I decided to do things that made people people feel uncomfortable. And that was really important to me because one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to be proactive. In order to be proactive, people have to feel uncomfortable. And when they feel uncomfortable, that's when change happens, right? It's when we all learn. And as a uh, professor that teaches in the School of Business, I always tell my students, when you feel uncomfortable, you're learning. They look at me and go, no, that means I don't understand. I say, exactly. So that means you're going to learn. Um, so one of the things that I really was focused on was that, you know, up until that point, there was, a, there was engagement in the community, but only on the surface. So we would have people go and to go to the Hmong New Year, people invite, you know, people <coughs> bringing different cultural foods and do all kinds of things like that. But diversity and inclusion was so much deeper than that. 
It wasn't just touching the surface. So one of the things that I proposed that we do was before we go out there and try to engage with the community, we first had to know who we were as individuals, why we thought the way we thought, why we did the things that we did. And as a result of that, I encourage the police chief and the, the, the superintendent to start within their organization. And that meant that people had to have very difficult conversations about who they were. And so when we started at the police department, it was very difficult for the officers to do that. Um, because, you know, I, I think we all think that we are very open-minded, that we're as inclusive as we can be, um, and that, you know, we, we don't, we're not racist, that we don't think of anybody different um, as, as, you know, something different than what we would normally do for anybody else. Uh, but what we realized through that process was that there are reasons why we do the things that we do, and if we don't change that, there was no way that we would truly be engaged with the community and get to the level where they could trust us. So we had to know who we were. And that was very challenging for everybody. Because in the past, when people talked about diversity, it was all foods and celebrations and cultural dances and things like that. But we needed to get past that point. And um, at that time, I think I was, I know that I was very blessed to have two very forward-thinking leaders, including the mayor, who all, all often said yes. Yes, I think that's good, yes. And he, he would be very supportive of what we did and to challenge people to think beyond just the cultural, the very um, the feel good things on the surface and to go much deeper within themselves was something very new to people. People did not want to go there. And Ron Dunlop isn't here, but Ron and I talked in depth about having courageous conversations about things that were happening within the community and why we felt the way we felt about those things that were happening. And it had to start internal. So that was, I think for me, that was a very uh, cre a key pivotal turning point that we started to look at things beyond just the, the surface piece of it, but to be able to go deeper and to really challenge people to start thinking differently and to understand themselves first before we could try to go out there and understand other people and empathize with them or to get them to trust us. We had to understand who we were and why we thought the way we thought. So it sounds like some of the things you're, you're touching on is um, good leadership and how diversity and inclusion can work for the entire community. But Kathy, um, at the same time, research suggests that given the, especially the current environment, certain groups, people of color, women, uh, LGBT, can face different challenges in companies, communities, in the country. Challenges that make it more difficult to access opportunities, networks, resources. In your view, what are some of the, the systemic challenges um, in the uh, Appleton Fox Valley community and what role um, could, should the diversity coordinator play in helping to address some of these challenges? Okay, great. Um, so in my time there, I think you know, this is kind of mixed with, you know, the accomplishment or where we kind of were moving toward. I think some of the things that we moved the needle on, um, anti-black racism for one, I think we really highlighted discussion about what that was looking like in the Fox Valley and inclusion, you know, in, including Hmong and Latinx and just all different identities, but especially the black community who we really hadn't heard a lot from at the table within city government. And so um, we held an event about the state of black America, and I think that was with African Heritage, um, who is a strong partner of the city of Appleton, um, the chat team, and, and some other organizations that I'll forget right now. But that highlighted some of the issues, along with the plunge into the issue of what's happening in the black community and the inherent racism um, that still exists in our community. Um, if you're a person of color, if you're a LGBTQ person, um, and you're walking down College Avenue, there is still, there are still slurs shouted out. There's, you know, um, racism still exists. So uh, very much so in the city of Appleton. So, and if you talk to people in other communities, um, we do a lot of great things in Appleton, but I can tell you from my counterparts, my offices in both Appleton and Milwaukee, I have 
colleagues who say they're black and they say, I'm not coming to Appleton. I've heard about what happens in Appleton. I heard about how you get treated as a black person in Appleton. And until we have that shift and change in behaviors with our community members who are the very, again, the small minority of individuals who are perpetrating that behavior on other individuals, we're going to continue to see um, that behavior, that, that racism behavior on the rise. And, it, and it's being fed nationally, and it's being fed with an anti-immigrant and anti-refugee um, agenda nationally, and that, that trickles down into communities. And so what we need to continue to do is see our leaders like uh, Mayor Tim Hanna, um, you know, the school district, other leaders, city council who uh, can step up and um, pass ordinances and resolutions um, to hold some accountability for that. So in the city of Appleton, we, in my time, we passed an anti-discrimination ordinances uh, protecting the rights of transgender individuals. Now we were at that time one of three communities who had done that. That's a step in the right direction. But it's, you know, that's an ordinance. That's like something on paper. What we need to do is start shifting the behavior and the attitudes and around accountability because a lot of racism and anti-LGBTQ, homophobia, transphobia, all of that anti-immigrant um, hides behind um, religion. It can hide behind um, people feeling that they have a right to free speech, which we all have a right to free speech, uh, but they, 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 they cover themselves in that because technically sometimes they're not breaking the law. And so, you know, we can't look at the police department always to be the ones to solve that issue because if it's not a criminal justice issue, then it needs to be back into the community and we need to be having community um, responses on how we can address those issues. And so that involves, you know, um, Casa Hispana, and that involves the Fox Valley Literacy Coalition, that involves African Heritage, that involves the Hmong American pa Partnership, or Hmong American um, Association, that involves the LGBTQ Partnership. All of these organizations need to partner with the city to be able to um, have their needs and their concerns be heard by city officials like Karen Nelson and the mayor, and I know our health department, uh, Kurt is here, and, We've got all individuals that need to be hearing from these community members. And Karen Nelson's position, uh, the diversity and inclusion coordinator, is a, is a kind of a liaison who that person hears a lot of that feedback. And I, I think what we need is our leaders to, to have an open door with that position to hear, even when they disagree, even when they say, boy, I, I, that's not my experience in this community. I have a perfectly fine experience. They need to hear from that person in that position that this is what our community members are feeling, hearing, and this is the hurt that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Pauli, um, let us pick up on that. What, what advice uh, would you have for those who want uh, who want to be DNI advocates and, and supporters, but they're just not sure how to start? What should they do? What's an what's an important first step? That's a great question because uh, I work at Lawrence University as Associate Dean of Student for Diversity and I get that question almost every day. <laughs> um, and I think uh, really um, my advice and suggestion is the, the first start is really to be much more aware, right? You have to be aware of the issues um, that are happening around you, not just globally but locally. Um, and I think the other piece is um, you have to be more educated. Um, and, you know, education is broad. You know, it's not just in the classroom. It's in engaging with your community. It's having sometimes uncomfortable conversations, um, you know, that you're learning from one another and you're growing in a variety of different ways. And, um, you know, getting yourself more involved with community events, you know. I think sometimes, you know, um, if people are uncomfortable, sometimes going to the celebration event is the first step, right? Making that in initiation, going to the celebrations, getting to know a little bit um, about the history and the culture, and then diving a little bit deeper, you know, having some of those intentional conversations, really get to know people on a personal level, um, and then, you know, be able to kind of um, incorporate change into action, you know, so it really is all about building relationship and, and building partnership, um, and, you know, as a collective, as a whole, as a community, I think we can make much more of a bigger impact um, because I, you know, I, I tell my students all the time, you know, when, when equity wins, everyone really wins. Okay. Um, let's go back to the audience. Um, questions from the audience for the, for the panel members. Yes, sir. Step right on up to the mic. All right. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for coming and uh, really appreciated it. Um, I wanted to, to bring up um, a topic that is, is somewhat unique to, I think, the Fox Valley, but is not entirely because 
Um, uh, I live, for example, I live in Darboy. And I, I, if anyone asks me, I'll say, oh, I live in Athens because they're not from the area. But if someone here, I'll say, I live in Darboy. And, and um, we have, a, a, depending on your point of view, we have a, um, a, a lot of choices for, for uh, municipalities in this area, or we have uh, too many. Uh, it depends on your point of view. Um, it, it, and the uh, effect of a, of a person um, from a marginalized group in this area um, well, I think there are many things that Appleton could do a ton better, and, and, uh, and I appreciate Kathy bringing those up and, and pointing those out. Um, it's going to be different in, in Appleton City proper versus any of the municipalities or in the towns. Uh, as an example, the town of Buchanan, I, I, I saw that uh, where I live, there's 10,000 people, and in the previous census, there were four people that were African American, which is, is not uh, a random sample by any means. Um, so, how do you feel that this position, as well as um, how the leaders as a whole navigate this viewpoint as it, as it relates especially to a place like Kimberly Clark where people are going to be uh, working, living anywhere as well as, um, you know, in, in just as a community as a whole. Good question. Good question. Thank you. Um, There's a lot there. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, that was when you asked about one of the challenges when I was um, in this particular, in my, during my tenure. Um, it was just that, the the districts and the jurisdiction, and I often had lots of success with family, and then I would go to document everything, and they were like, oh, that's a menashaw, Russell, and I thought, oh. But then again, I often went with, uh, um, you know, do the thing that needs to be done, and then um, Deputy Chief Peterson and Chief Myers were always really good about kind of saying, okay, but keep in mind, you work in the city of Appleton, and I also know that, you know, an issue has no boundaries, an issue has no jurisdiction, and they could, we service them in Appleton, but they also go back to Menasha, or they go to, to Darboy. And um, issues or, or solutions actually transpire and transcend um, jurisdiction, and it is as diverse as diversity itself, too, and so we were, we're very beneficial that we have so many communities and municipalities with, with a connectedness, but we also have a great source of communication. We also have terrific media, terrific newspaper. And so even though some of our services were supposed to be intended for just Appleton, we, I was given the permission to go ahead and do things for Darboy, Nina Menasha, um, even Outagamie County or Winnebago County. And so um, it was fluid for when I was there and it was allowed to get some of those parameters. Okay, I can fit my new body right in there. <laughs> this was one of the biggest issues that we dealt with, uh, whether Karen Harkness is in the room, the mayor, other people. We got a lot of pushback because we did impact the Fox Cities a lot with this position, and it will continue to impact the Fox Cities, um, especially when the issue of teen suicides um, you know, were through the roof, and 80, we found out that 85% of those teen suicides were kids who identified as LGBTQ. Um, I think once again, the leaders had to stand up and say, we can't, we're, you know, the city borders don't end. I mean, they've gone a map, they end, as, as the mayor has often talked about, they end on a map like that. But those issues don't end, because guess what? Appleton kids were very impacted by those suicides that had happened in Kakana and Kimberly and Little Shoot. And there were times that I spent in those school districts and in those communities. It was never more time than I spent in Appleton. And I will say that you are right about the work-life balance, because this position does not happen. Um, sorry, I hope they told you that before you got hired. Um, because you're, you can be, you try to go out of town and you can be eating at dinner on a Friday night and somebody from another community or your community has an issue and you, you're outside of those, you, you're just outside of all the boundaries of time and, and limitations. So I think um, it's something that continued to get brought up by our city council often because, you know, taxpayer dollars. Um, and yet, the best practice was that we knew that if there was a healthy Fox Cities, there would be a healthy Appleton. And so Mayor Hannah probably went to bat for that more than anybody I've ever seen, and, and I think it includes it in a lot of his speeches, not that they're all the same. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but you do. You, you, he includes it in a lot of his speeches because it's so important, and it's such, that has been an ongoing pushback that we have had with this position is, oh, you work for the city of Appleton. Well, you know, these issues impact all of us. So when we started, I, I think we had um, issues in other jurisdictions and things like that, but I think the leadership of 
that time, and I think leadership going forward, uh, if they are engaged with, with each other, and they support each other, and they work with each other, that's really important. When we would have issues in Manasha, and it would come to, to me to address, um, of course I work for the city of Appleton, uh, the police chief and I would talk through it, he would call the municipality, whoever was in charge there, and talk to them about it, and provide advice on things that we could do, and things that we could do to support them, and encourage them to act on that, um, and to have them take ownership of it. I think that's really important. Sometimes we have a tendency to go and try to fix problems all over the place, and people feel like, okay, whenever we have an issue, we're gonna call Kathy, and she's gonna fix everything for us. Um, and, you know, we can't be like that. We have to, everyone has to own um, everyone's challenges and opportunities. And I think that with the municipalities and the leadership, if they talk to each other, and they take ownership of it. They can support each other, but yet you still have to take ownership. And that was one of the biggest things that we did during my tenure, was not to go in and try to fix all the issues, but to make people aware of it, and make them come to the table, and take ownership of it, and be accountable for change. Because it wasn't just for us, it was for their citizens, their residents. And that's really important. Um, and I really am a proponent of people taking ownership of, of different issues and holding themselves accountable and holding other people accountable for change because one person can't change everything. It takes everybody to enact change and to sustain change and to move forward. Outstanding. Thank you. Um, so we're just about out of time, so let me uh, make some closing um, um, comments. Um, while I am, so first let me say congratulations on, on 20 years. I've already shared with you that that is unprecedented. And while I'm impressed with that, um, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that in the two years I was here, one of the things I was concerned about as a corporate diversity and inclusion leader who was asked by my CEO to partner with the, the city of Appleton was there was this constant um, uncertainty and debate about the value and importance of, of the position. But I think um, I, the two years I was here, I saw tangible um, evidence of the impact of the position. I think what you've seen here and heard here tonight um, is not just that two years, but then 18 years prior to that, um, tangible, proactive, intentional actions which have helped um, in some cases, incrementally, um, make uh, not only Appleton, but the Fox cities uh, a little bit more welcoming, a little bit more inclusive. So if I could say so respectfully, Mayor, uh, the other uh, city le leaders, it's time to stop debating whether or not this position is important. I'm glad to Karen um, expressed interest in the position. I made sure that she did her homework and checked with pre previous pe people that had the position because I wanted her to know what she was stepping into and that this wasn't a traditional um, diversity and inclusion role. It was really a role of the future where you have a partnership between the business community, between the education community, between city government, and that was, and, and, and again, when I think about where the, the challenges that we're facing in, um, in our companies, in our communities, in our country, this position is needed um, now more than ever. But it can't do what it needs. The things that need to be done can't be done by Karen alone. She's going to need your help, your support, your prayers. Um, how about a round of applause for our panel? I'm going to turn it back over to Karen. I have something that is very near and dear to my heart. From the city of Appleton, I would like to present to each of you my business card candy bar. Because you each have been a part of the foundation that I'm now stepping onto, meeting community needs and enhancing the quality of life for 20 years in the city of Appleton. Thank you.
photographer, I'd like to make a couple of uh, acknowledgments at this time as I transition to the next part. Is my photographer still in the room or did she leave? Mr. Moderator, I wanted to take one uh, group picture up here before, uh, before we go to the next one. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to make a few acknowledgments as we begin to uh, transition to where do we go from here and our call to action. I'd like to first of all acknowledge the Honorable Mayor Hannah for saying yes, as he's already described at the top of the evening, and saying yes to me to create this event with only 90 days on the job. He said yes, and now here I am trying to pull this whole thing together. It has been a, an absolute joy getting to know every single one of my predecessors. I count it all joy because in my culture, I believe in paying homage to those who have gone before. I'm not walking into this position thinking that all of a sudden it's going to be perfection and a new broom sweeps clean, but rather to pay homage to those ladies and that gentleman and those men who were the visionaries to create the position. I'd like to also acknowledge the principal of this fine institution, Dr. Matt Mino. Will you stand once again? I think some more people have come into the room since we started. <laughs> and do you know what, ladies and gentlemen, it did not just start and end with the principal. He literally opened the door to every aspect of the school for this event tonight. The Media Design Club is here. That's who's walking around videotaping. That's who's live streaming right now on East uh, website via Facebook. And also the Lantern, uh, block, uh, excuse me, yearbook staff is currently taking pictures. So this will also be chronicled in the student's yearbook at the conclusion of the year. Larissa Davis. Lawrence University photographer. Are you still in the, that, that's who was just taking our, our group picture, thank you. She's our quasi-professional uh, from the filmmaking school there. Is Amy Swick in the room? I know there was a school board meeting tonight, so thank you for squeezing a little time in for, for being here. Because, thank you, yes, give her a Because I wanted to be able to book in the entire evening by sharing with you the growth and the evolution of the position. So many of you may be wondering, so what's going on now with AASD in terms of diversity since this position started as a uh, joint position between the two organizations? So Amy Swick is here as the co-chair of ACE. And ACE is actually spelled out on your program. They took a different um, view of using the word diversity and inclusion, but it's actually their achievement, community, and equity position. And it's now, my goodness, this thing is mushroomed to what about 50 of us now are on this committee that are just focused entirely dedicated to issues of diversity and inclusion as it relates to the Appleton Area School District. So thank you for being here again tonight, Amy. She's also here uh, along with Kempton Freeman. Will you please stand? He is the AASD Multicultural Specialist for the entire district that focuses on multicultural issues in the classroom, pedagogy, everything you can ever imagine that is so important to uh, also including helping our uh, assistant principal, Mike Slowinski, to uh, provide such a diverse group of greeters, greeters that greeted you here tonight. So you see, once again, it takes a village. And that village was throughout all of Appleton East High School tonight. You may also be wondering, so what's going on with the APD now? I would like to now invite to stand the current Chief of Police, Chief Todd Thomas. Please stand and be ready. I had a 
feeling I was doing okay in my interview panel when he was sitting straight across from me and next to the mayor and I said, okay, if I can, if, if I can get that guy to smile, I think I'm doing okay. And he has been a joy to, uh, to work with up to and including uh, um, very recent events. So thank you, sir, for being here tonight and showing your support that way. I'd also like to, I would be remiss if I did not mention the members of the Common Council you all are the reason why I am here and that I have a new title. Uh, uh, Kathy Flores advocated for the addition of the words and inclusion. But it was these guys who actually, and ladies, who actually ratified it and turned it into and made it official with the creation of my position of being named and entitled diversity and inclusion. So will all of our all Germanic persons please stand to be recognized at this time. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, this is this is just the beginning. I wanted uh, I wanted us to uh, to conclude the evening a little bit early just uh, to allow a few moments at the back end of our time together so that we can close out with some intentionality. We've now commemorated the first 20 years and now I am pleased to report to you that we've got a clear vision with our current leader in terms of where do we go from here with intentionality into the new year. With this, I'd like to bring up Dr. Kimberly Barrett from Lawrence University, the Dean of Vice, Vice President, excuse me, of Diversity and Inclusion at Lawrence University and Dean of Faculty. Well, good evening. I am extremely honored to be part of this, um, I think, reflection on history and the wonderful work that's being done here at Appleton. Um, I came here a little more than a year ago um, to take a wonderful position at a great um, university with a wonderful national reputation um, to be closer to family and to pursue um, the work that I am very passionate about, social justice work within the context of education. Um, but in arriving here, I found so much more than just a job. Um, you know, I was met with partners um, in the city. Um, Kathy Flores who was part of my um, interview process and was certainly someone who I would say mentored me and helped me along as I as I made the transition. Um, I met the mayor here, who has um, been a wonderful partner and I think advocate. And I've also had the honor of working with the police chief, you know, Chief Thomas, um, in trying to make sure that we have a welcoming environment for our faculty, staff, and students. Um, but, you know, most importantly, and I think the thing that has impressed me the most is just the widespread participation of citizens across the Fox Cities in trying to make this region more inclusive. I think um, what I found is not a lot of questions about why we need to do this, um, but a lot of questions about how. Um, Polly talked to us about, you know, she gets asked that question every day, and I think I get asked that question every day, probably ten times over as well, um, how do we do it? And I think you heard some wonderful explanations of how it's been done over the past 20 years, but I'm extremely excited to be part of the introduction of a program that I think is going to take the entire community to the next level in terms of helping all of us know how we can help make Appleton and the Fox Cities more inclusive. And it's a program that's called the Dignity and Respect Campaign, and it's modeled off of a program from Pittsburgh. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit about that in a video. Um, but I can't tell you how excited and how much I've anticipated rolling this out. We're going to have an official launch in, in January, but we're going to give you a little preview um, of what we have in store.
excited yet? We are just thrilled. So if you want to know what we're going to do to build off of the awesome work that's been done in the previous 20 years, join us. You want to know what are we going to do beyond just the city of Appleton from a governmental standpoint. This is going to include everyone. And we invite you to join us. Dr. Barrett, would you like to share with them our next steps? Well, our next steps will be um, having an event at Lawrence University uh, where we roll out um, how this will, will play out in Appleton. Well, it will be a little bit different. Um, and we'll allow people to actually sign the pledge and see how they can get involved. So look for an announcement early in the new year and we hope that you'll join you, join us at Lawrence University. And let's give Karen a hand for bringing this. My partner here in diversity, who has also led the way with that interim year since Kathy's departure in 2016 and, and Dr. Barrett starting at Lawrence University in 2016. And here I come in and just wanting to be the bridge to bring it all together. So thank you again, Dr. Barrett. Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I see all my predecessors over there just grinning from ear to ear. I, I knew you'd be pleased. I knew, I knew I was, they wanted to know what it was all about. And I said, you have to come and I'll tell you all about it. So thank you all for being as excited as I as we are. Uh, in closing, I'd like to end with a couple more acknowledgments uh, because diversity means a lot of things. And I have an entire 16 point uh, periodic table, if you will, for diversity. And one element of that, the 16 elements of diversity includes supplier diversity. And I am very, very pleased to announce and present to you the creator of the 20-year Appleton Diversity and Inclusion logo, which is TCM Communications from Milwaukee. Will you please stand? Thank you for pressing your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Mitchell, they did a fabulous job, I believe, incorporating, as you can see, not only are we talking about equity, which includes the ACE program now at AASD, but also unity in the community, which is the mayor's favorite word, but also captures the initial word, uh, operative word for Pam's position when she had it, which is intercultural, which I think is a powerful, very unique word. And of course now including and ending with what, what the title is today, diversity and inclusion. I think they did a phenomenal job in capturing that vision. I'd also like to uh, thank my husband and son for pressing their way right after the funeral to be here with me this past weekend. Stanford and Stanford the second, please stand. Thank you. Our, our firstborn, our daughter, uh, was with us in South Carolina uh, for the passing of my mom, but she had to get back to work today, so uh, she wasn't able to uh, join us again. But I do have a couple of uh, closing things to announce to you. I have, wow, Mr. Moderator, you're so generous. So uh, Dr. Shelton Good, I invited him to actually have a, a table to sell these books, but he decided that he would uh, allow me the opportunity to simply bless someone and four people, it's like in the audience, I thought it was just gonna be the one. So I have a question I need to ask, which is who has lived in Appleton the longest? <laughs> Cookies and Punch Reception, Cultural Cookies, 
that have been sponsored by Dr. Judith Baseman. I am so happy. She promised me. She said, Carol, just keep talking and just join it out. And I'm going to try to scooch right in there and just do it. And then there she is. Please come up and, 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 and say a few words. I know you missed the program, but your presence was certainly here with us the entire time. Dr. Judith Baseman, current superintendent of schools. But we did have a school board meeting and I came as soon as I could. So I just am so, I heard the unveiling of uh, the new initiative and I am just so excited to partner with Karen and other leaders in the community to really bring this throughout our school system with our families and our kids. And there are so many wonderful partnerships already in place here in our community. And this is just one other way for us to really get to the foundation of how we are with each other. And day in and day out, you know, we have wonderful opportunities in our schools for kids to really um, embrace the diversity that we have among us. And so thank you for having this event and um, we're just happy to celebrate along with you the announcement of this wonderful, wonderful time for us all. So thank you. Compliments of the AASD. Let's go have cookies and.